Stay tuned. Grok Talk will be live in less or more, slightly more. Wait, if I keep talking, it'll be in one minute. <laughs> Two minutes. Sorry. Two minutes. Stay tuned. Talk will be live in less than a minute. of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Uh, don't you love it when I do that? It's been a couple weeks. I, I was listening to the show last week, which we did live from the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers uh, Family Reunion, Taxpayer Picnic, and I was listening to myself go, uh, um, uh, um, uh, and I'm like, oh my god. Welcome to Grok Talk. We're going to try to reduce the number of uh, uh, ums if we can, but uh, we'll do that. Hopefully, uh, you're not turned up yet, see, because I have these all these buttons. And you have the master controls. I do, I do. I have the master controls. So that would be Grok Mumble? Grok Mumble. <laughs> Grok um 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 uh, Our guests today, uh, we are expecting Max Abramson, Kevin Bloom, Mike Ferris, who's going to join us to talk about the SCOTUS same-sex marriage, and uh, Lawrence McQuillan. Uh, he has a book out about the pension problem, and uh, we're going to talk to him about that. I get a, I'm getting an echo. I'm feedbacking somewhere. Where's that coming from? Uh, do you have your audio on? Somewhere I'm picking it up. Mike? Don't oh, think so. And I wonder where it's coming from. You hear it? Do you hear it, ladies and gentlemen? Do you hear it on Facebook or Twitter? Do you hear it on iTunes, iHeart, Spreaker, TuneIn, or Stitcher? Hey, by the way, while we try to figure out what that is, since we took all the equipment and then brought it all back and hooked it all up and it was all working great until just now, um, you can go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Grok Talk and support this program. It's our latest way to help you, uh, help uh, us. I can hear the music very faintly in the background. I know the music. There's an issue with my music, and I'm going to have to... It all of a sudden got really quiet for some reason, and uh, we'll keep checking it out. Anyway, uh, I'm going to work on that for a couple seconds. You gentlemen start talking until Max gets here. Absolutely. And uh, there's plenty to talk about. A lot of things happening nationally and locally, as usual. Let's go hyper-local for right now, because S Steve beat me to... We're in Concord, New Hampshire, and they've now finished half of their roadway redo. Oh, so Main I see, Street, yeah. Yeah, so Steve has already pulled in and got out of his car, so I rolled my window down because I was across the street at the red light, called out to him, Steve! And when I did, I saw this little painting on the brand-new black tar. Mm -hmm. And as I pulled in next to him, I went, bike lane. 
Right. I am just waiting to see what's going to happen because if they're declaring that the cars and semis and big trucks that go through here, they have left so little room between the end of the slanted parking for cars and what's going to be the median strip, and they put this bike signal on or bike symbol on there. Bike path I'm, symbol, yeah. Yeah, it's like usually a bike path, it's a dedicated set of space for it. Now they're saying you will share the, the road with the bikes, and I'm thinking I can't wait for this thing to happen because... It's essentially, you can't have northbound heavy vehicles up Main Street. They're going to have to go around Stores Drive because there's, there's just not enough width there. Uh as it is, by restricting restricting it to one and a bit lanes plus parking, any time anybody reverses out of a parking slot, the entire travel lane will stop. Uh, it's going to become non-viable for through traffic and too much trouble for anybody to come to the shops. I wouldn't. Well, here's the, here's the deal. This is typical of the Sustainable Communities Initiative by HUD, EPA, and DOT, and the Concord folks fell for it f- full line and sinker with their professional planners. And The with shopkeepers no- here should have asked the shopkeepers in Nashua before they let them do it because I can tell you the shopkeepers in Nashua are going under. Yeah, and I saw the same, been watching the same thing for a couple of decades up in Laconia after they did their urban redevelopment which uh, made it a whole walkable area, and the, it never has recovered. I mean, there's some, there's a, it comes in waves. The storefronts sit empty for a while. Some people move in. They start to you know, open up new shops. And then a couple of years later, they go out of business because what the planners don't seem to understand is that nobody lives downtown. I don't think people want to live, quote, unquote, downtown for the most part. They want to live where they, yeah, the, perfect clown car time yeah and if you're not going to make it convenient for people from out of town oh we have a parking lot three blocks away that's convenient enough i'm sorry if i'm carrying a bag i mean these guys don't get it this is the instant now no inconvenience generation and if you're not going to do that for out of towners people don't care to come there's two ways to use the main street if you want to walk around, enjoy the ambiance, have a drink, go get a meal, walk around some more, you don't mind parking in the parking garage. If you want to get something, whether it be fragile or heavy or just bulky, from a store and leave, you want to park outside that store, get it and go. And if you can't, you won't come. Yeah, I guess central planners hate men because men hate shopping yeah. for the most part. When I go shopping, I here's my list. I know exactly where to get it. I even know the aisles in the grocery store where each item is. I know what I want. I want to spend the least amount of time getting in, getting it, getting out my money, paying for it, and getting out the door and getting home. It's, it's why, for example, I hate the southern part of Daniel Webster Highway in Nashua because it's all about getting in and out of various strip malls and then the shopping mall at the end. And it's backed up the entire shopping day. And I don't go there if it's shopping hours. Yeah. This is interesting because I go to Market Basket and I, I shop there regularly. And I go and I have a list. And I actually have my list. And it's the list is where the stuff is in the store. Oh, I don't get so that. Oh, I? <laughs> so I just go and I go get it and, and I leave. And sometimes I'll grab maybe one or two other things if I happen to remember that I need them while I'm there. So I was uh, there in the bread aisle which was packed with people. Mm-hmm. And um, a gentleman says, uh, I don't know why, he was talking, I don't know why we both come here together. We always end up spending twice as much money. And I just started laughing because it's true. Because when I bring my wife with me, we end up buying all this other stuff. And it's not just her, it's me too. It's like together, it's like squared. You know, it's shopping <laughs> squared. We've Logarithmic, now, you get it, more than twice. We go in to buy $50 worth of stuff and we leave with 150 or something like that. It's crazy. Yeah. So, anyway, Max has joined us. Good morning, sir. Hang on, we'll uh, get your headset all set it's up. It's Big and, Max. And uh, Max joins us today. Uh, uh, the subject may have changed because we arranged this several weeks ago, but you had mentioned something about the dumbest law in New Hampshire. Well, we have a contest for school age kids and college students mm-hmm. in New Hampshire called New Hampshire's Dumbest Law. And at first we thought we'd find three or four really silly, outdated ridiculous laws that don't make any sense may have been passed over a hundred years ago um, and of course the contest is to find what is the most ridiculous dumbest 
most outdated, nonsensical law that just makes you laugh or scratch your head and wonder, what were they thinking? And we've heard from quite a few people, and uh, of course the deadline is September 15th because the, the deadline for submitting LSRs is September 18th. They, they just, didn't, anybody mention the hands-free law just right out of the gate? <laughs> yes, a few people have <laughs> mentioned that. Um, it might be a little soon to repeal or work on that. However, some people have noticed that if your GPS goes off and has one of those yes-no questions uh, while you're parked at a at a stoplight, that a cop can still fine you just for pushing the yes-no button. So that's, whether that was the legislature's intent or not, that truly is a ridiculous law. Yeah. And I noticed that in the paper... Sorry, Steve. No, go ahead. In the paper, the, the first car accident that came up... Hold my thought. <laughs> okay. Um, was not a distracted driver because of texting or calling or talking, but coffee and a radio. Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking about this this morning. Now, the only time this I, I conveniently have just had to purchase a new vehicle because the motor on my Honda Accord died. It was 16 years old, so that stuff happens. So I get a new car. It's it's 2013. It's not new. It's new to me, but it has hands-free in it. So I'm like, oh, well, that's good timing because the law starts in a week, and, and so that worked out. I've been trying to set it up. but So I'm, not, I'm okay with that. But then when we went to CNHT, I used Google Maps on my phone, which I couldn't touch, to check while I was driving. So I had to pull over, stop, do my thing, and then go again to make sure I was, because I don't go there very often. I go to Hillsborough once a year for the CNHT picnic. That's it. So I'm in the drive through getting coffee on my way here. And I'm pulling up to the little speaker, and so I order my coffee, and as I'm going around the corner, you know, I'm pulling up, I'm getting my wallet out, steering with my knee, you know, finding my Dunkin' Donuts card, da-da-da-da-da, you know, and I'm not in traffic or anything, I'm just right there. But if I could do that, if I just touched my phone and there was a cop there, he'd write me a ticket or at least give me a warning. It's ridiculous. Oh, he, shouldn't be, he shouldn't be able to do that on the private property of Dunkin' Donuts. Mm. I, well, this is an example. I mean, yeah, if yeah. I was doing it in... in before I turned in to get to the Dunkin' Donuts? Yeah, it's possible. Regardless of whether or not I felt capable of making that decision on my own safely, which I did, you know, it's just crazy. Well, well, you know, people make decisions every day when it's safe to pick up the phone, pick up the microphone, tap a key on something. The policemen do it millions, well, millions, multiple times per day because they've got their their radio, their, probably their cell phone as well, their laptop-type terminal, and they use all of this stuff, and most of them manage not to hit anything. I know, because my company sells that stuff <laughs> to, <polices. laughs> to the police. We do. Right. And you uh, look but, inside but, the but, police cruiser, and it's Knight Rider plus a laptop. Yeah. And they, and they think that we are incompetent to use a subset of that. So well, did we you get any other yes good? No. Oh, my goodness. Well, the requirement for a submission is you have to be going to school or school-age kid. Homeschooled kids are okay. College students are okay, any age. Um, you have to list either the law or the RSA so that we can find it. Um, because if you go to legislative services and you just say, can you repeal some law, they might not be able to find the law. So we have to know what it is. And you have to give a reason f why you want that law repealed. Um, so there are a number of websites and there are a number of forums where people have brought things up. But they've been submitting more and more... Um, ridiculous laws to the Facebook page, New Hampshire's Dumbest Law. And some of my favorites, my personal favorite, is um, it's against the law, New Hampshire, to put on a puppet show for money or any other, or promote any other public competition without a license from the selectmen of the town. So Dave Ridley, who does Ridley Report, correct, did... Uh, Which you all should be checking out if you're not. He's very funny. He put on a show, puppet show, in public in front of the State House of Civil Disobedience to show that it's illegal to do a puppet show in public. Now, I don't know if they've repealed... It looks like they didn't repeal that law, but I guess there was a... <laughs> that is was, funny, though. <laughs> there was not a bill, but an effort to put in a bill that never went anywhere. But it's one of those ridiculous rules that, that makes no sense. I'm sure there was a reason for it. Someone mentioned... The use of milk containers. Nowadays, we recycle our milk containers and reuse, and we're all into the environmental thing. Um, but RSA 184, Section 30-D says, No milk 
and milk product container shall be used as a receptacle for any substance other than dairy products. Now this was passed in 1907, has been modified again and, and again. Skip and I look at each other. <laughs> okay. Back in the days when you had these small glass, Bottles, thick, yeah. thick glass containers. Oh yeah, we used to, I used to, uh, and those were reused <coughs> for milk. Yeah. So I, I mean, I can understand where you wouldn't want somebody storing kerosene in it and then thinking, oh, that's a milk bottle. Let's put milk in it. Yeah. Now I remember getting the home milk delivery when I was young. The, every morning, every Thursday morning, there's the bottles we, of milk. Uh, we didn't, but I had neighbors who had the milk box. Yeah. So. Yeah. And there's a law that says that it has to be pasteurized. Milk has to be pasteurized. You can't have raw milk, except that there's a little exception in there for raw milk. If you advertise it in that's, your business that, as raw milk. that Hey, that's p- pasteurized milk. Right. That's you said for pasteurized milk. <laughs> yeah. For, uh, I don't know He said many. pasteurized milk, and Steve's doing like this. I'm going. Pasteurized <laughs> milk. That's what that uh, is. The virtual cow. Sorry, Max. Radio listeners probably aren't going to get that one. The video ones okay. will. I'm milking a cow. Past my eyes. So anyway, <laughs> Sunday work. We have RSA three thirty two section D, uh, which said uh, which are all of the blue laws, things that you can't do on Sunday. You can't operate heavy machinery on Sunday. There are a whole number of things that you can't do. Well, contrary to what the Bible says, uh, the RSA say no person shall engage in any play, game, or sport on that day, which has to include puppet shows. <laughs> Well, what do you mean, contra the Bible? The Bible, the Bible does... says that's your day of relaxation and rest and enjoyment, and uh, you're supposed to honor the Sabbath. Yeah, but if you go back in history, and the best example of the Orthodox Jews who hold firmly to this, there is to be no work whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, it is supposed to be a day of relaxation and contemplation. Mm-hmm. So causing someone and, to work on and, your behalf... And no <laughs> contemplating work, either for yeah, that Yeah, I matter. mean, it was... Very much uh, not not a time to go out and have a whole lot of fun. I mean, it was basically doing nothing. Okay, we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to come back and have some more fun with these crazy laws. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. I'm bleeding for you people. One of the exciting things about shaving and having ulcerative colitis is that sometimes I break out when my medication somehow manages to get balanced or if I forget to take it. So I get acne in strange places. And this morning, having put shaving cream on my face, I'm moving along nicely, you know, having no problem. And then I went to put the razor right near my lip. Are you doing an Obama with the middle finger? (laughs) Obama... (laughs) I'm going to put a Band-Aid on in a second. Um, all of a sudden, you just, you know, you know you caught yourself. Ah, my rip. <laughs> so there you go. This anyway. Is, this is why you use an electric razor. I do sometimes okay. use an electric razor, but I prefer, I'm blade guy. I prefer a blade shave. So, reminder, Facebook and Twitter, please follow us, Granite Rock, And uh, check out this and past programs on iTunes, iHeart, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher. And remember, we are now at patreon.com slash grok talk. You can donate and help support the program. Let's talk about goofy laws now. So I did a little bit more research, and I found a number of, I found a list of, of some of the best. It's a top 15 list. You may not tap your feet, nod your head, or in any way keep time to the music in a tavern, restaurant, or cafe. Now, I'd heard about that one, but I haven't been able to find the RSA for it. Um, there is one RSA 
332 Section D, you cannot run machinery on Sundays. That's an older one. Um, actually, all of, I think, 332 is uh, 1960s. Um, it's illegal to inhale bus fumes with the intent of inducing euphoria. <laughs> so it's legal to inhale bus fumes, but not if you're trying to get high. Now, when I was a kid, we waited at the bus bus stop at school, and they had all of these diesel buses <coughs> running, producing diesel fumes, idling for, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes, and all the kids are sitting around waiting to go home, breathing in diesel fumes all day long. Not all day long, but for about 10 or 15 minutes. We're sitting there. We had and to they, stay and, there and, because and buses they, would leave they, at random they, times. They had much higher uh, levels of... Uh, both unburned hydrocarbons and uh, carbon monoxide in the diesel fumes back then than they do now. I got that beat, though. If you work at UPS in a center, if you have, when they go to get ready to leave in the morning after you're done loading the trucks and you're finishing up, you get a hundred and some odd package cars, half diesel, some regular regular uh, unleaded fuel, all firing up inside a building. Yeah. Granted, it's a huge building, but it's still inside a building. So for a good half hour... You're just walking through this stuff. I mean, that's why when I used to come home, I smelled like diesel exhaust. And when I get done, I yeah. go to my next job, I have to take a shower. Parents in Texas were upset because their kids were coming home smelling like diesel fumes every single day. Was it an exhaust leak? Who knows? They smelled like diesel. Kids came home smelling like diesel. So on the, on the ride to school and the ride home, they're breathing in diesel fumes all day long. So they switched to biodiesel. They saved money. And the kids come home smelling like French fries. No, the, well, biodiesel <laughs> actually fumes actually smell kind of like sourdough. Um, biodiesel fumes, th- there's a myth about them smelling like French fries because so many come from French fry cookers. Um, once you combust it, it, it smells kind of has kind of a soury odor to it. Um, but the kids were kids are breathing in diesel fumes all over the country. They're uh, the unburnt fuel and they're breathing in the exhaust and it's impossible to completely contain fuel diesel is a lot better than gasoline uh but again the kids are breathing this in so they switched to biodiesel they saved money of course biodiesel costs less than regular diesel um the engines on the last longer they don't have to spend as much money on maintenance so i brought this up with the seabrook school board and i said well why don't you guys switch to biodiesel and they just said no well, part of it may be cost and availability. Well, part there's a lot of biodiesel in New Hampshire. It's average. Yeah. I think and it's cold. And there's a company it? called it, yeah. it Smart Fuel that sells biodiesel in Seabrook. It's right there, and they sell it truckloads. Six thousand gallons. Shell up in the cold, wicked bad though. Well, so, so does regular diesel. I know, fuel but too. I mean, it's worse with biodiesel. Yeah, I, think. I know, but you can mix it at mm-hmm. different quantities. So, um, well, it's an option. I mean, uh, obviously, if you want to save the district money, and, and but it's, it's not an option because. No, they're not going to do it. They, the problem with school boards is um, everything is done under the RSA, so they, they have to deal with the lawyers, they have to deal with the state statutes, they have to deal with the SAUs, and they have a lot of really dumb laws. You can't just hire the principal who you want to hire. The SAU brings, this is the dumbest law in the state right here, the SAU brings forward three candidates, two homeless guys and their candidates. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to hire one of the three. And if you reject them all, they bring their candidate back and two new homeless guys. And eventually you have to hire their candidate. Or you operate on a acting principal, your vice principal, for however many years this fight goes on, months or years. And Anybody ever elect a homeless guy? The school board <laughs> So has they're discriminating to... against homeless people? <laughs> The, the individuals who are absolutely not qualified to serve as a as a janitor get brought in as the two alternate candidates. And this is the statute. And the SAU on its own gets to decide if someone is qualified or not. No qualifications. They just get to bring in people who should never be around school children. And once in a while, the, someone who should never be around school children gets hired as the principal. Of course, you know, with the now now the big push is since gay marriage is now legal in all 50 states, or 57 states if you're sitting with Obama. Um, There's now the push for polyamory and polygamy to be made legal. Mm -hmm. And now we're also hearing, as I posted up, uh, a push for folks like the Nambla folks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's no longer a perversion. It's just a a minor child 
Uh, what was the word that they used? Sexual orientation in orientation. California. Orientation. Uh, yeah, minor child California orientation. California recognizes pedophilia as a sexual orientation. It's like an alternative lifestyle as far as they're concerned. Yep. And I've been telling other conservatives, and some of them don't believe me. And I said, after transgender, the next group they're going for is pedophiles. Yeah. They want to... They want to this, this is the Political complete. correctness, you're going to have to accept pedophiles and, and, this and their folks, choice of lifestyle. This, folks, is where the overlap of the leftist progressive agenda and the Muslim agenda occurs. Well, <laughs> it, it's Sorry. possible, but it, that's, but that's, it is... That, uh, that complete, unfortunately is you're true. Gonna, you can legally marry your camel. What? Uh, <laughs> How do now they? it is. Com- it is actually. This was foreseen by a Democrat senator, Daniel mm-hmm. Monahan, who was the former ambassador to the UN, <clears throat> where he said, "All we're doing is defining deviancy down." And uh, heck, I would be brought up on some star chamber uh, environment just for saying. Defining deviancy down by those whose deviancy has now been downgraded. Um, it really Will tree is. Tree huggers be looking for a next level of in- intimacy. Right. Well, I, you know, <laughs> Don't I, laugh. Somebody was arrested for I, that. I, I have an opinion. Oh. There might be a law against that. Uh, Maybe it falls yeah. under the puppet show thing. I don't know. <laughs> but it's not. It may not. <laughs> it may not be illegal to rape a horse in New Hampshire and a handful of other states, oh. because it's legal to have sex with a horse. But how do you gain in consent New Hampshire? from a horse? Yes. How do you gain consent from a horse? Flick of the tail? The horse says nay. Does that mean nay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, does no really mean no, according no to Bill Clinton. No means maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, Bill Clinton's going to be in big trouble pretty soon, because no means yes. Well, I mean, if you Is? look at the, if you look at the, uh, the feminazi... Um, you know, constant consent people. I mean, he's guilty of raping millions of women, technically, probably just by, you know, Joe Biden. He touched people. You know, there's all these things that show oh. up that, that obviously do the, don't apply to them. But in the real world where the rest of us live, where they try to enforce their rules, um, if you open a door for a woman, you might be committing rape. I can, don't, you know. Can, can we bring back Ted Kennedy from the dead? Because, you know, th- that uh, Senator Dodd and Senator Kennedy infamous waitress sandwich, mm. that, that would have been enough to get him in trouble. Oh, yeah. So how on the left Mary Jo Kopechny keep, keep, has no uh, are, are there ideas underwater yet? The coalition <laughs> of angry, man-hating feminists together with Middle Eastern countries where... If a woman is raped, it's legal to honor kill her. And and they, her word is she needs five <clears throat> witnesses to be the equal of the rapist. Oh, yeah, no. the Sharia law. And, and, Sharia and, law. Yeah, the. And for oh, any matter, get you me need started. two women to get an equal uh, to have an equal opinion to one man. Wow. Uh, yeah, it, it's 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 really bad stuff, folks. But I'm I'm going to stick my neck out. Uh, the gay staff will probably come after it. Um, so you look at what's going on, and you refer to you know pedophilia and Nambler. And you know, I've observed something. You know, we 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 read about Muslims trying to groom teenage girls, uh, you know, for for sex slavery, but it's not that men in general and old white men are predatory, but there is a certain class of gay who are predatory, who go out and try to groom the youngsters and get them into the lifestyle. Terry Bean. Terry Bean. Right. It, it, is in, it is a fact, and it is how a lot of them become gay in the first place. Well, you know, it, I see occasionally... They talk about having spirit. a deep bench, right? Oh, oh, oh Steve. Well, you know, you wrote about Terry Bean, this pedophile, high-placed Democrat donor, and, and, and ha- it's like the, the media has just wiped it clear... You're the only person who really kept writing about There's it. There's updates in Oregon. Yeah, in a but local, that's about one it. In a local paper that I know of every week or so now because there's a lot of things going on, but nobody else covers it. Yeah. You know, I went to the state house on the same-sex marriage issue. I went to the state house. I, going back to the 90s, I was a kid. I didn't know anything. Um, I'd always been a supporter of same-sex marriage. The Libertarian Party had been a supporter of same-sex marriage back, to, you know, going back to 1972 when it was unheard of. Because it was an equality issue, and they had no problem taking controversial opinions back in those days. And the Libertarian Party also ran the first ever openly gay presidential candidate back in 1972. Fast forward to 2000 and some odd. I went to the state house to testify in favor of the same-sex marriage bill, and I I can't remember the 
the, the hearing, but I remember that I decided not to testify. I just kind of sat there. And it's all these divorce lawyers coming forward, and it's the Bar Association. And I go to the Bar Association's website and start doing a little research. And, gosh, the lawyers really seem to be in favor of this. And then you see the if you've seen the movie Divorce Corp, which I would strongly recommend that viewers go see, um, it shows how the divorce industry and the divorce lawyers just absolutely destroy families, destroy their assets, pit people against each other, turn the kids into chips in a high-stakes poker <coughs> game, and the highest, when they assign a dollar amount per child, what each child is worth in divorce court, in, in, uh, in uh, the family courts, the highest state in the nation is New Hampshire. It's over $2 million <coughs> per child. Over $2 million per child. All right, we're going to take a break and head into our next segment. You're certainly welcome to stay. We're expecting um, Kevin Bloom and somebody else. I think I just saw Dan out there, but we'll, uh, we'll be right back shortly. Stay tuned. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a religious freedom issue, as I understand it. This is Grok Talk. We are back in studio, and we hope you'll stay tuned. And while you're waiting, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Stay there. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Rock Talk. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Hey, it's Grok Talk. Welcome back. Live from Concord, New Hampshire. Thank you to the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers and, of course, the bloggers at GraniteGrok.com. Remember to check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Follow us. Like us. Love us. We are also on iTunes, iHeart, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, and you can now go to Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, slash Grok Talk, and make a regular monthly donation to the program to help support this awesome radio show. Love us. Love us. I'd rather settle for respect. You can hate us too. I don't care. You can hate us. You can be disinterested. Just listen and share in the glory of Grok Talk. We are waiting for Kevin Bloom to show up, but uh, but half of him is here. You're the lawyer. The good half. He didn't tell me who the lawyer was. He said, "I'll I'll I'll call the lawyer." Maybe he did tell me. (laughs) I don't even remember. But. you can tell us why Kevin's not here, or you can tell us why Kevin was why coming. Kevin's not here. No. You can't tell us why he wasn't here. It's the empty seat Kevin. syndrome. Yeah, so we're going to talk about Kevin since that's the role. Anyway, no, welcome, he's not here to welcome himself. to the show. He's not here. That's exactly right. <laughs> like the empty right. seat behind the Oval Office desk. <laughs> All right, no. so you guys are bringing Valerie Jarrett's yeah, a lawsuit. Or, uh, yep, so I'm um, representing Kevin in the Church of the Sword, and what happened was he was p- applying Church for of the Sword. Church of the Sword. And... So the religious freedom issue. Here you go. Yep. Well, I'd hate to see what that sacrament is like. <laughs> Feel free to come one of our religious services, and you can sword fight. It's part it's of here. things we do. And so, yeah, what happened is um, the Church of the Sword filed for a tax abatement with the town of Westmoreland, and that was denied. So they denied it without giving a reason. I think there's an issue there. But so what happened is we filed um, 
in Superior Court to appeal that decision, and the town of Westmoreland filed a motion for summary judgment, which is a fancy way of saying dismiss this case. Mm -hmm. So we appealed that, and now it's up at the New Hampshire Supreme Court, and we just turned in our briefs last week or two weeks ago now, so waiting for town of Westmoreland's response, and ultimately this issue will be decided by New Hampshire Supreme Court. Okay, so tell us um, the Church of the Sword. Yes. It's Westmoreland. Yes. Sounds like an interesting name. I'm not sure, you know. Well, Kevin I mean, would know how they came up with the name, but um, he would, so yeah. the, uh, he's you're not here. You don't know why. Okay, uh, Kevin. Uh, well, <laughs> but you know something. It, it we does, are mobile. He could be listening, going. Yeah. Oh, I'm supposed to be no, there right I'm now. Supposed to turn it. To you know, I do understand though. Is it the role of government to define what religion is? And we've been seeing this now since Obamacare went. We've got the HHS mandate that says that you were supposed to, that all organizations were supposed to supply contraceptives and abortifacients, and several cases have gone to the Supreme Court uh, over government cannot tell us to violate our religious conscience. And several of those groups have won, although several have not. And I do see this creeping bad wind coming where people are starting to say, we get to define what your religion is for you as long as it fits our purposes. And if your religious consent or conscience does not fit what we need as for, for the common good, we will override you. Just have to look at the, uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor, where they're saying, we do not want to sign the acknowledgement that we will not... that." Providing a board of fastens. This is a group of Catholic nuns who, for 175 years, have done nothing but care for the poor. They're generally elderly. Um, they don't want to apply uh, having their insurance agencies uh, supplying a board of fashions just because they sign a piece of paper to the government that says we will not do this. Because the law then says that their insurers have to supply it, quote unquote, free of charge. And I'm sorry, there is no free of charge. Somebody's going to pay. And they see this signing of the letter as being complicit in that mortal sin. Now, I'm not Catholic, but I'm not going to define for Catholics what their religious beliefs are. And I believe it's very well, deeply held religious beliefs. And these people have given up everything to care for the poor and the dying. It isn't the role of government to define what religion is. And I guess that's what you're saying here. As, as much as it may sound outlandish, that's what's happening here. Well, I think this is the exact problem, is that the um, ultimately the court found that Church of Sword isn't religious without defining what religious is. So I think that's the issue, is that the U.S. Supreme Court never defined religion as well. We're specifically asking the New Hampshire Supreme Court to define religion, or at least adopt some oh factors. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm I, not... I, I think that's a bad idea. Yeah. Well... <laughs> I, I really, uh, it, it, it is. It, that's the equivalent of asking for permission instead of waiting to be told no. I'm sorry. Well, they uh, were told uh, no. When, that's when, how it started. When, you know, okay, <laughs> well, yeah, but but ask, asking to have religion defined is is in inviting it to be defined narrowly, and I think. Uh, you know, you have freedom of speech, association, yeah. and conscience, and they can't stop you. Would it well, be my guess that, that the point is to determine, um, I just completely lost my train of thought, the state's role in recognizing what a religion is, which is kind of the same thing, but not exactly. Yeah, um, yeah you, do, you do not want to get religion itself defined. Uh, there are left are already trying to define religion as what goes on inside the walls of a church and you have no right to your conscience outside. Well, that's a poor definition. All right. I would like it defined differently. I think one of the things that the court should look at is... I didn't say is, it was right. I said it's what we're <laughs> up against. <laughs> yeah. Um, if it's a sincerely held belief, I think that's a good starting point. And I, be I believe in what you're saying. You know, over the years... I, see, I have seen all kinds of definitions, you know, the church of this or the church of that, the church of something else, and you keep going, really? But there's a limiting factor to what I can say, even if I was still in government uh, or elected or as judge or what have you. There is that limiting factor that says in the First Amendment, free expression thereof. And to me, that is the limiting factor against government, because that's what the Constitution and the Bill of Rights is supposed to do, is to limit government. But you have listened, if you've listened to Obama, he has always said the freedom to worship, 
which is a far cry, goes back to uh, Mike's stance of you get to worship within the four walls of your house of worship and in your home, but nowhere else now in the public square. And that is where they're trying to box it up. So I, I think you're doing the right thing by you know, having this suit. The local government, the county, the state, or the Fed should not be in the business of defining uh, what what religion is. And as much as I hate the phrase separation of church and state, because oftentimes it's used too often against religious people and people of faith, um, there that should be a solid wall of separation where government cannot say what a valid religion is, just like what Mike was saying. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I hope you guys win this suit and then turn around and sue the pants off the local folks and forget about qualified immunity. Go after them individually for even daring because it's it's always the every dollar is sacred at local mm-hmm. governments. You cannot deny us a do- dollar either an income or a dollar that we wish to spend. Trust me, having been on my my budget committee for a couple of terms – that's how liberal progressives, spend it, quality of lifers want to define the budget. It's all about what we can do for our pet projects is what it comes down to. I have a lot of Kevins in here. Boy, I'm trying to get a hold of it. He didn't send me any email. I'm going to text him, see if he's alive. He can't check it, but, and I mean, if he has answer, you're he can. precisely right that the state cannot discriminate and favor one religion over another and that's exactly what they're doing when they're granting tax exempt status to one religion and saying another group of people we don't like your religion your religion doesn't count and how orthodox does your religion have to be before your religious freedom is protected do you have to do you have to wear special clothes do you have to have special ceremonies do you have to have all kinds of special cloths and foods and rites and holidays for it to be a religion Well, not only that, but they can also, and more importantly, because we are becoming a a country where the law is the morality. It's no longer an internal law. It's no longer an internal morality. When you listen to the progressives, if something is not expressly prohibited by law, um, it well, you could also you could take it both ways. It has to be expressly limited by law. Otherwise, you can't do it. Here's the here's the the pattern that I've noticed from the left is the only thing that they want to legalize is something that is outlawed in the Bible. Everything else they want to be illegal, regulated, mandated, or controlled by the government. Well, going back to our original discussion in the last segment, where there has now been a Democrat legislator in uh, down in D.C. who is trying to remove husband and wife from all marriage type law. Mm-hmm. And then you're reduced to spouses. And Which, a, by the way, if you look at corporate documentation, it's been that way for about 10 years. It, it always refers to your spouse. Yeah, but it's still the, the basis of has been man and wife. And Steve's, going back to Steve's post of a couple of weeks ago, the whole idea is to basically dissolve the whole idea of marriage. And that's a really bad thing because, again, we were originally set up as a limited government a wide civil society where individuals outside of government were able to interact and do their things voluntarily. And then of, you know, then the, the person themselves, the family has been a big bulwark of that civil society. And now we're seeing the effort to dissolve the family as government is outsourcing, not outsourcing, but out crowding the rest of civil society. Pretty soon, that we are going to arrive at that Hobbesian Leviathan, where there is only government and individuals. And how long can the individual stand up against a Leviathan government? And the fa- if you strip away the idea of husband and wife, spouses and spouses, where you're only bound by contracts, then you know, as I well, followed your links, then the privacy of the family disappears because now it's just individuals. And then you think that the government's going to leave that fam- what used to be called a family unit alone? Not happening. There are more states talking about doing away with marriage licensing. Part of the reason for doing away with marriage licensing is, again, they're seeing what the divorce industry is doing to the family, what they're doing to families in this country. Well, you've got to read this piece I posted because it's about that. Oh, it is, it is scary. It's, it's the, 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 the kicker is that there are these far left Marxist central planners who are Feminists. very open about what they want who support 
the, dis, the removal of marriage licenses in every state, and they explain why, and it's what Skip just said. They want to get rid of that because they argue that it gives the government the opportunity to go into the family, separate them into individuals, and regulate the crap out of them just like anybody else. And or you, anything else. Or anything else. And when you go in and you look at that and you read what they write and what they say and the influence that they wield, you may very well say, you know what? Maybe marriage licenses protect families, and that is essential to the foundation of well, our I system see, of government. I, 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 I take a, a somewhat exception to the concept that you need a marriage license per se. Uh, I mean, originally the only thing you needed was the blessing of the church that you were suitable in their eyes to be <coughs> married under God, their God's uh, view. Different world, though. Assu assuming that the churches had some variations, but I mean, basically all uh, Christian churches have the same kind of view, which is you have to show that you're a practicing Christian, and then they'll consider you worthy of being married under their purview. But you know, whether you're whether you're married in a church or whether you're married in the town offices by the clerk or the judge, uh, it's the act of being married and the marriage certificate. Uh, your marriage license implies the state has to give you permission to get married first. So I, I kind of think it's it's less government to not need a marriage license. On the other hand, um, the legal entity known as a married couple has protections under the law, such as not being able to incriminate each other or being forced to incriminate each other. And that's really important. And I'm going to point out a situation very close to me. Yeah. Where that would be wrong. Okay. Okay. My son has been with his girlfriend long enough to maybe be called a common law marriage. Mm -hmm. Not married. But this absolutely illustrates what Steve brings up in that he has no legal right to the two little children that he loves dearly. And they love him as well. And the state can come in and just take him out of that environment for anything for any reason that it wants. There is no legal protection, which if you remove the marriage license, that's the situation he is in. And he literally would die of a broken heart if, if government were to come in for whatever reason, under whatever circumstance, and break apart that unit. That's and right. trust me, they can do it because he has no legal protection. I, I, I get that, and I've no, I'm no big friend of the social services uh, for the kind of stuff that they pull. That's not the, but I think you're looking at the wrong instrument, uh, Skip, which is you know under common law and under statute in most uh, jurisdictions in the Western world, there is such a thing <clears throat> as a common law marriage. Whereas if you've been together for a certain time, you have. Uh, legal interests in each other's properties and in the ch in the Should children. Should the state no, even no. have the power to take away your children? No. Well, that's and and that's the point that Steve and the and these papers were trying to to say that without that explicit marriage uh, recognition by the state, I, they can do whatever they see, want. I and given the slippery slope that we've been on on everything else, we're going to take a break in a second. But I think I understand what you're saying. You and shouldn't I, need the piece of paper, but in the current battlefield you do so the question is do we keep it till we can get rid of it and, I, and i'm only drawing the distinction between a license to get married and a marriage certificate which is what you sign mm -hmm. either in a legal office or in the church in the presence of witnesses which is legally binding upon you and the state more on religious liberty in a few minutes we'll be right back hi this is rich gerard host of dread at large in the morning the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW New Hampshire Family Radio and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Marriage Blues. 
No, it's the government versus marriage. Blues. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, microphones are up. The discussion is good. Half of our guest is missing. <laughs> he is not answering his email. He is not answering his texts. I hope he's okay. Maybe Kevin? he was imbibing a little too much at his new restaurant, yes, Area 23. Yes, Area 23. Yeah. It's in Concord. It's in Concord. Come, come visit well, and us, partake us, of his services, please. Let's get back to the Church of the Sword and learn more about it. Then. Well, he doesn't really know so much about the details. We need Kevin and he's not here, so can we Google it? <laughs> Is it in there somewhere? You can well, Google it. They have a website. And, okay. And, um, Mike, Church of the Sword, find it. Anyway. I was making balloon animals at the Church of the Sword. Every balloon animal that I do, though, is always some variation on the little wiener dog. Yeah. So my giraffe is a wiener dog with a long neck, and my elephant is a wiener dog with a trunk, and so forth. Everything. It, were... it, is that what is sacrificed on the altar at the Church of the Sword? Not to just to have a little bit of levity. I don't see balloons <laughs> and swords being a great pair. Unfortunately, uh, it... yeah, I, we did uh, inadvertently sacrifice a few. Uh, but I made I made I made a balloon sword. As long as you don't have a puppet show, there <laughs> for money though. For money. For money. Does, does it, it have to be wooden puppets? Doesn't have to be. Doesn't say. Does it? This is puppet show, right? Their sword is like a stick with some padding wrapped with duct tape. <laughs> so I, so I, I, I always only imagined, duct tape. I always imagined a church with an alt. Maybe the new one does have it. Church with an altar and a great big golden sword somewhere. Is there idol or something? No, it's. Their ritual is sword fighting. That's wonderful. So, no, what I what I liked was the statement right at the top of the web page. Please donate to our legal defense fund. Send lawyers, guns, and money. <laughs> <laughs> I will accept guns in lieu accept of money. Guns in lieu of money. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, I gotta. Unfortunately, part of our use, our uh, producer pro doesn't work all that well, so I'm just going to hold this up. Yeah, it's not that easy to bring in Church. external pictures, is it? No, not audio. right now. I haven't been able to figure out how to redo that. Maybe with the next upgrade, I need to remember the next time I bring our Ustream PC back home. Patreon.com, ladies and gentlemen, make a donation and we'll save up some money and update our producer pro so that yeah. we won't have to hold the iPad in front and, of the And Patreon eye of Sauron. Uh, is, is for starving artists like Patreon us. is to support artists, uh, any kind of artist, and that includes podcasts, vlogs, anything, art, actual art, music. Cinema, Grok Talk, and Grok, T- Grok Talk, Grok TV, and, and the masterful right. photoshops that occasionally grace exactly. our pages. And, and you can don- donate to our art form and help support us because, I mean, we're not looking to make a living on this. We're just looking to keep it going and, and things break down and software yeah. needs to be updated and, and phones yeah, and, and, and modems and I, need and to be paid and for. I have and a new heroine for my Photoshop attention, which I'm going to have to work yeah. on. Internet yeah. stuff. And since, since, and, since our governess is, uh, is, is, pl- is pro-planned parenthood, the uh, and she likes having minions. The new accompaniment for the minions is a villainess named Scarlet Overkill. <laughs> How delicious! J- j- uh, just let me add on to what I got to get to work. <laughs> let, me, let me just add on to what Steve said. Not a dime goes into our pockets. We all at Granite Rock and Grok Talk have full time jobs to support our families. Every dime that is donated goes to either keeping Granite Rock up on the air or going for this equipment, which. Some donations have come in for it. Lately, a couple of he- new headsets have come in. Uh, donations for those, we greatly appreciate it. Instead of having to pass the headphone, we thankfully uh, people put money in when we pass the hat. Uh, but yeah, and we have the enough most, headphones now. The, mo- the most we even have and a an spare extra one. Yeah, that we're not using. but the most esteemed wife has let me purchase most of this equipment over the years, and uh, I'm very grateful for having her let me do that this board that software those headsets or that board well no i'm talking about stuff that we've purchased thanks to people giving us some money to help pay for things yes people help pay for this people help pay for the software people help paid for these headsets and we appreciate that because it's allowed us to grow the program yes so and it we we do appreciate which is free speech which is in the same amendment as, as religious for, liberty. <laughs> yeah. And I will say. Six you know, degrees it from is, Kevin Bacon. That's yeah. right. <laughs> uh, our name is Granite Grok. There is a church of the Grok. We found this out with a couple of emails and a couple of nasty phone calls. They actually thought that by opening up Granite Grok, a political website, we were joining their church. You know, the, we got... The word grok, which means to understand fully and deeply. Do we wear white book. robes? I think not. <laughs> yeah. 
from a from a book by Robert Heinlein Blue called Collins. Stranger in a Strange Land, and they actually formed a church after that book. Now, to most of <clears> us, <throat> probably sounds like a silly idea, but it's a perfect example of yet another church, Dan. They have their own religious beliefs. They thought we were violating their beliefs by using the word grok in a, in a secular political sort of way, and they let us know in no uncertain terms. But, again, it comes back to what is the proper role of government? Is it to define our conscience? I think that's what a lot of the people are doing, and you see the gay marriage. It is not about legal acceptance of gay marriage. I don't think uh, they they would be content with that because it first went from civil unions. They weren't content with that. Then it had to be marriage. I think they are looking for positive and celebratory affirmation of that. And a lot of that is now being implemented by government. To, and that's violating the consciences of a lot of people. Um, I will tell you that a good friend of mine out in Ohio, their church, which I wrote about this week, said, we will no longer do weddings because they are afraid of being sued now that gay marriage is the law of the land, that they will be sued for sexual discrimination, even though their theology, and I agree with their theology, says it is anathema. It is a sin to bless something that is sinful. And that's the, the word, sinful that the government is saying, you aren't allowed to say that anymore. And I think we're, we're going to see, you know, yours, your suit on the Church of the Sword is a microcosm of the larger writ, writ large that I'm saying Orthodox Christianity is going to severely be attacked. And again, we're seeing the Hobbesian view of Leviathan government reducing any interstitial space between government and its force and the indiv the single individual, because that's what's happening. We are div being divided into individuals. No more voluntary associations, be it marriage or, in this case, a church. Is it any wonder the citizens are arming up because they feel the beast growing closer? Well, I think that has to do, at least on the right, with a lot to do with how Donald Trump is being seen, where a lot of people are upset. They see traditional American life being destroyed. And they are scared. And I and I have to say, I am scared with us. We are Susan not being Olson, led to a utopian. Yeah, Susan Olson posted something this morning, right before I left, that uh, illegal immigrants commit 10 or 11 times as many violent crimes or as many homicides. And no one is talking about this. Well, Donald Trump talked about it, and, and, and now he's being railed against. And now the establishment GOP is now attacking him and trying to distance themselves from Donald right Trump. but 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 let's let's be clear on a couple of things i've been listening to some of my back copies of limbo because i try and play catch up you with, got about like, with the podcast so um f first of all i think trump won't be shut up which is great secondly on the second amendment trump's absolutely firm on nbc a couple of weeks ago they tried to box him in uh, and said well what about gun control and what about gun violence and he said i'm not gonna go there it's a slippery slope i'm absolutely for the second amendment any of this stuff is going to take ultimately take away from your second amendment rights but that's not what he believed uh, a while ago, where he was in favor of an, a, a complete ban on assault weapons. I mean, I, I understand the appeal that he has, but when you start researching some of what he has said in the past, you kind of got to go, mm. Yeah, I know. That, uh... But the, he is absolutely tapping into a vein on the right of people saying, this is not the America our founding fathers created. And they're looking for somebody to stand up brashly and brazenly swing that bat at the, and pr protect what they believe. And I think the establishment GOP, as you pointed out, um, uh, that they're, uh, they're cowards. They're not standing up with the exception of perhaps Carly Fiorina and Ted Cruz and, and in Religious Liberty, Bobby Jindal. They're not standing up. They just want to be under the radar or say it in the smooth, soft, silky political They are liberal, and nobody likes them, and people don't like voting for them, and they lose every election. Well, and that every is the, single election. We saw that here in November with Walt Havenstein and Scott Brown. When they went against their own base, they lost. And I'm seeing that, you know, if somebody like a Jeb Bush gets in or a Chris Christie or uh, not Steve King, but what's the other uh, King from Scram. New York? 
Peter King. Peter, Peter King. King. George yeah. Pataki. George, and a Jim, couple of Jim, others. Jim Gilmore, who I'd like to come back to. Yeah, we, I still have to put, put up the video from CNH. You may not have time for that. But, you know, we're... No, we're, not right now. If, you're, if we're not going to pick a candidate that's going to swing for the fences for us, why should I give them my expensive vote? All right. Coming up. Absolutely. Mike Ferris, constitutional appellate litigator. Uh, and he's the uh, chancellor of Patrick Henry College, chairman of the founder of Homeschool Legal Defense Association. We're going to talk about the Supreme Court ruling on same-sex marriage. Skip's going to give him a buzz during the break. Dan, thanks for coming in. Thank uh, Kevin, wherever me. you are, I hope you're okay. And if you show up at 10, too bad. See ya. <laughs> if you like your current health plan, you can keep okay, it. Line one. That's not true, Senator. 22,000 yeah, citizens one. <laughs> have been kicked off their insurance plans. Hospitals in Rochester, Concord, and Portsmouth, they aren't allowed to provide care under the exchange. Senator, you were wrong in your comments. You should apologize for your misleading remarks. I'm calling Senator Shaheen at 750-3004 and telling her I want my doctor back. You should, too. Paid for by saberpack.org. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate committee. We are struggling. Rising health care costs are part of the problem. Senator Jean Shaheen helped create this mess we're in. As a state senator, her bill chased 21 insurers out of our state. It reduced our choices, raised prices for New Hampshire families, and when Jean Shaheen supported Obamacare, it limited access to 10 of our 26 hospitals, reducing our choices again. Tell Jean Shaheen she's made health care worse. Few things are as important as finding the right doctor. And under Obamacare, that's harder than ever. Over a third of our hospitals no longer available. Our doctors no longer covered. Fewer choices, longer drives. No state has been harder hit than us. And even after watching it impact New Hampshire, Congresswoman Ann Custer still supports it. Call Ann Custer. Tell her Obamacare isn't working for New Hampshire. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Rock Talk is brought to you by the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers and the bloggers at GraniteRock.com. Thanks for listening to the live show. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. And uh, you can listen to this in past programs on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, TuneIn, and Stitcher. YouTube. And we are on YouTube and, of course, Ustream if you're watching the Ustream or the uh, Spreaker live stream audio. Those are choices that you have available to you, and we like to continue to expand those choices. And uh, we're looking at getting into broadcast in various ways online. We're always looking for ways to expand our reach and to get more people to listen to the show. So uh, in, in that vein, we like to have guests who uh, know a lot of things about a lot of stuff uh, that we don't always know about. And uh, Mike Ferris is a constitutional appellate litigator who served as lead counsel in the United States Supreme Court, eight federal circuit courts, and the appellate courts of 13 states. He is uh, one of the original co-authors of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, is the chancellor of Patrick Henry College, and chairman and founder of the Home School Legal Defense Association. Welcome to the show, sir. It is my pleasure to be with you in New Hampshire, great state. Thank you very much for coming on. So uh, we want to talk about, or actually we planned to talk about, we can go anywhere you want, of course, um, about the recent uh, Supreme Court ruling on same-sex marriage. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, that decision attacks two of the most basic principles of what it means to be a country called the United States of America, and that is the principle of self-government and the principle of fundamental rights. Self-government is that we elect legislators 
to make the rules. Or, you know, at the state level, we can have direct democracy of, of the people vote on things at the, at the state level. For example, marriage. 32 states voted to say we want to have marriage to be recognized only between a man and a woman. And the Supreme Court said, nah, we think our political opinions are better than the opinions of millions of people. We're going to say it's going to be same-sex marriage that you have to approve. So the, 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 either, in theory, in legal theory, the legislators elected by the people in 1868 legalized same-sex marriage when they created the Equal Protection Clause, or the Supreme Court made it up out of thin air. And of those two options, there's only one. And, and one is um, simply not possible if you're going to follow the Constitution properly, and it just violates the principle of American self-government. And in the meantime, they managed to uh, tag on a, an attack on religious liberty that is going to come along with this. Now, this is Skip Murphy, and I want to say thanks for coming on the show. Um, we were, in the previous segment, we were talking about the ro the proper role of government and religion because we have uh, Dan here in front of us who has brought suit about uh, the local officials not giving a tax abatement to the Church of the Sword. Now, I'm not sure what the theology is, but, you know, the general topic is, is government the proper role or, or the proper vehicle to decide what is a proper religion or not? And what we've been seeing from the Obama government is the the twisting of the words in the First Amendment from being the free expression thereof to freedom of worship, which means get out of the public square and it's only good for being in the your home or your house of worship. And we see a lot of the the militant atheists doing the same thing, trying to push it push religious people, people of faith, out of everything. And you're you're absolutely right with this decision and I also relayed and posted up on granitrock.com. Good friend of mine who reads the Grock all the time. Their their church just decided this past week to no longer hold weddings. So on this topic, how far is this slippery slope going to go with this recent decision? Well, uh, it remains to be seen. the The decision itself is a decision about state government's duty to issue marriage licenses, according to the Supreme Court. Not a real duty, but a Supreme Court-imposed duty. Um, and it does not directly attack churches and so on, but it does indirectly set the stage for those attacks. Um, there will be requirements of either state law or local law or IRS regulations, or there's going to have to be some other additional layer of law because a basic principle of constitutional law is the Constitution binds the government. It, you know, I have no duty, either my, at my house or at Patrick Henry College or any other private entity that I'm involved with. I don't have any duty to guarantee equal protection of law or freedom of speech. I can tell people to shut up and go away. Uh, it's my house. It's my business. It's, you know, it's the college I run and so on. So, but, but if I was running a government institution, uh, then you have to obey the Constitution. And so, um, but private entities are controlled by statutes, regulations, and, and the like. And so we're going to see IRS regulations attacking churches. And we're going to see, um, you know, edicts from governors and state legislatures and city councils and so on. Following the philosophy of the decision, and the rainbow commandos, as I've come to call them, are going to be out in force making sure that all these kinds of local, state, federal mandates, laws, regulations will be on our backs and in short order. Now, one of the things I've been saying to this morning, probably more than I ever have in the last year, either speaking or writing, is the Hobbesian model of Leviathan government. Are we at that tipping point? Because, as you rightly point out, everything is now controlling what can be done within what was supposed to be civil society and now down to the individual level. Are we, in short order, no longer be able to say the land of the free because everything that is now free is only because government has not yet prescribed it? Um, yeah, I, I, I think you're exactly right. And to you know, return to your religious liberty point, it, it, it's the best way to tell because what preceded religious liberty were uh, so-called tolerance laws. And tolerance laws, you could be tried for heresy. The, the rule is basically this. 
if you didn't differ from the official Orthodox too very much, there were five specific areas allowed to disagree from the Church of England and the Tolerance Acts of William and Mary, for example. If you only disagreed in those five acceptable areas, you were tolerated. Otherwise, you were tried for heresy and burned at the stake. And, and that's what we're seeing in our society today. We don't burn people literally at the stake, at least not yet, but we're burning businesses at the stake with a $135,000 fine on bakers for not baking a cake. And it's just simply, we, we are, are and, and to your point earlier, we are losing the free exercise of religion. The freedom of worship is not what this country was founded upon. It was the free exercise of religion. It was the right to bring your religion into the public square and stand up. Religious people have the right to stand up and say what they want to say based on their religious belief, just as much as the atheist has the right to stand up and say what he wants to say based on his atheism. But a free country cannot exist where we lose the difference between tolerance and liberty. A liberty-based country is free. A tolerance-based country is not free. It's socialist. It's big government. It is the worship of the state. No, and I think you're absolutely right there. Uh, we are getting to the point where government is saying what is the public morality to a large degree. We've moved away from the idea of having that little guy on your shoulder saying, no, 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 you really don't want to do that, and most people obeying those, to where you know, my favorite example is Al Gore accepting lots of donations from Chinese uh, monks, and he said that there was no legal authority to prevent him from doing that. He's looking at the external laws instead of the internal morality. And that's what progressivism, socialism is. That is the morality where they encase you in bars of law, bars of steel, and to heck with what you think uh, yourself. And do you see that starting to happen at a faster and faster pace? The, the pace is dizzying. I, I've been doing li religious liberty litigation for, well, almost 40 years, uh, 39 years this year. And I, I can't, I, you know, I, can't, I can believe it, but on the other hand, I can't really believe it. I, I step back and say, is this really America anymore? And, you know, it, we are at a tipping point, but we, we have to make a decision what kind of country we're going to be in. If, if we go along and acquiesce in this and don't take effective, smart, savvy political action right now to change it, which basically mo means moving the game from Washington, D.C. to the states. And there are ways we can do that. But if, if we don't do that, we are toast because the, the cabal of big media, big cities, and big government has got a stranglehold on Washington, D.C., and there is no relinquishing it. And the people in those sectors all believe that the purpose of government is to provide for our needs and to run people's lives. The people in, in most of America think the purpose of government is to protect life, liberty, and property, and punish those who do evil. The, the second group believe in freedom. The, the first group believe in socialism, and they do not mix. Well, certainly if you say bring it to the states, I would, we all here would agree with you in the power of the states because it was the states that created the federal government in the first place and really believe in federalism. But, you know, all I have to do is look at uh, the very sorry example that Jim Pence in Indiana had. To great fanfare, Mike, they Mike proposed Pence. Mike Pence. They, thank you, Mike. Um, That's why he knew Mike, Mike, Mike. Mike. Go ahead. Mike, Mike, <laughs> Mike, Mike. No, not on Wednesday. Um, but in great fanfare, they introduced their own religious freedom law, and then two days later, uh, they bowed down to, you called them the Rainbow Warriors, we call them the Gestapo here, um, and they absolutely retreated. So it comes down to who can we trust anymore? If nobody is willing to stand up, other than Bobby Jindal, who did it by executive uh, order, you know, what good are the states? Well, the, 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 uh, it's a good point, a fair point, and, and I was really disappointed in Mike Pence. Um, but I have a, a good friend who's a state senator in Indiana. Uh, he actually used to work with me. And he said it wasn't, the, uh, as I call them, I'm going to get my term correct, the, the rainbow commandos. It wasn't, it wasn't those people or the gay stop. Well, that's a great term also. Um, it was Apple Computers and Alaska Airlines. It was, it was the corporate warriors that basically blackmailed um, 
that state into into submission. They would have they would have weathered the storm if it was just the uh, the gay radicals. They would have just kind of you know, shrugged their shoulders and, and taken it for a couple of days. But it was it was those big businesses, and so you know, as consumers and, and people, we have to basically say we have to punish those people. Um, if, if they're going to use their corporate power to accomplish those objectives, think Walmart, for heaven's sakes, mm-hmm. Walmart was doing the same thing to the governor of Arkansas. And, and so, uh, you know, if we continue to just go our way and shop at, buy Apple products and shop at Walmart and all those things, and we don't, you know, if, if we just one by one quit, that isn't going to mean anything to them. What we have to do is organize uh, efforts to say, you know what, if that's going to be the way you use our money once we you know, buy your products, we're not going to go there anymore. And we, we can fight fire with fire if we have the will to do it. Hey, Mike, I know we, I think we originally booked this for 15 minutes. Can you stick around for a little longer? Sure. Okay, we're going to take a really, really quick break. Stay on the line, and we'll be right back. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. The Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW New Hampshire Family Radio and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is the repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Welcome back to Grok Talk. I'm Steve McDonald here with Skip Murphy, Mike Rogers, Dan Hines, and Max Abramson. Our guest is Mike Ferris. We're talking about uh, the Constitution, religious liberty, constitutional law. Uh, he's a founder of the Homeschool Legal Defense League uh, Association. Sorry, maybe we'll get to that in a minute, but we want to continue on this topic. And Skip wanted to read something first, Mike, before we get back to the questions. Yeah, Mike, I have a page at Granite Rock called Progressives in the Proper Role of Government and Your Subservience to It. Here's a couple of quotes. New Hampshire State Rep. Uh, Chris Roberts, Democrat. Government has to protect us from our own stupidity. New Hampshire State Rep. Lee Webb, Democrat. The role of government is to legislate behavior. New Hampshire State Senator Sharon Carson. The role of government is to make people better. A Republican. Mm-hmm. Yep. New Hampshire State uh, Rep. Laura Pantalokas, Democrat. I don't care about protecting people's liberty. New Hampshire State Rep. John Mann, Democrat. Liberty is either an ideology or a gross misrepresentation and oversimplification, accidental or otherwise, of what government is for. Um, New Hampshire State Rep. Cynthia Chase, Democrat, concerning the Free State Project, having chosen New Hampshire as their destination state, even as she did as a Rhode Island transplant, what we can do is to make the environment here so unwelcoming that some will choose not to come and may and some may actually leave. One way is to pass measures that will restrict freedoms that they think they will find here. New Hampshire State Rep. Deborah DeSimone, Republican. The Constitution is a guideline. New Hampshire State <laughs> Rep. Sandra... Yeah. New Hampshire State Sandra Keynes, Republican, now Democrat. Now, this is a person who is creating our laws. And I'm going to ask you a question right after this. I don't try to justify anything by the Constitution. It's not my job, and I don't want to do it. <laughs> now, you listen to these people, and they are actually you know, well-regarded in the Democrat Party. Even but the as, Republicans. <laughs> yeah, even the Republicans. But you mentioned it earlier, and I'm going to say, what happened to the notion by our lawmakers that there is a limiting principle to government? Well, it got drilled out of us by, you know, incremental measures, and, and people bought into uh, the course of government over time. I mean, it, it started, it, you know, there, you can draw threads back a long ways, but in earnest, it began during the era of Comrade FDR. I mean, <laughs> FDR. Oh, and you're then, fine with that with us. Oh, yeah, don't, 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 you, don't you worry. My list of communists includes people who others don't like, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Richard yeah. Nixon. So, 
uh, in any event, they, uh, we, we have been pursuing um, a, a, a philosophy of government for a long time. I mean, it, it comes in fits and starts, and it's been incrementally uh, adapted and adopted. Um, but, you know, these people are reflecting uh, really, really um, clear understandings of the left's position on this. Now, my favorite, by the way, is that the Constitution is a guideline, because I say something similar to that a, a lot. It, 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 I call that the Pirates of the Caribbean position, because <laughs> in, in that, you, you remember where the, 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 you know, she, the young woman appealed to the rules of parlay, and the pirate says, they're not actually rules, they're more like guidelines. Um, <laughs> So I think you should call her the pirate. That's the pirate position of that she just articulated. Uh, um, and you know, people need to you know re- read something that's worth reading, like the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we are cre- endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For this reason, governments are instituted among men. So translate it, the purpose of government is to protect the liberties of the people that are given to them by God. That's it. Yeah, and I, and I, have, yeah, and I have a quick one there. I mean, I, I greatly appreciate you having founded uh, Patrick Henry College. Uh, one of my favorite quotations, which I signed my email with, is, the Constitution is not an instrument for the government to restrain the people. It is an instrument for the people to restrain the government. A- amen and amen. And so, I mean, I, there was an article in Atlantic Magazine this week, or at least I read it this week, um, about the Supreme Court decision, and they were they, the, the premise written. This was written by a prof, uh, professor of journalism. Uh, was <clears throat> that Christian colleges teach their students to obey the law, but the Christian colleges themselves were not planning to obey the dis, obey the law of the land, meaning the Supreme Court decision. And I had to write, you know, uh, I, well on my Facebook page mainly uh, a, a piece that criticized that that said, look at. The gov- these are not government colleges. These are Christian colleges. They're private schools. They have no duty to obey the Constitution. The Constitution is there to protect them, not to regulate them. And you've got professors, and what well, you've got judges at times saying the same stupid stuff. Usually not. Not that stupid. I mean, stupid, but not that stupid. Uh, um, I disagree. Well, okay. <laughs> Just this, take this, the- give me the word usually. But the... Um, <laughs> It, it, it's a bizarre system that we live in where uh, we're, we're violating the, uh, a statement by George Nicholas at the Virginia Ratification Convention. It's one of my favorites. And it is, an enlightened people will never allow that which is intended for their liberty to become an instrument of tyranny. And they were talking about the Constitution. And the prediction was the Constitution was going to be perverted and it would become an instrument of tyranny. And Nicholas was saying, no. Look, at if we have enlightened people, meaning people that know the Constitution, know what it's supposed to mean, they know what's going on in their government, and they compare what's going on in the government to the Constitution, and when they see a disparity, they'll take action and stop their government from violating the Constitution. That's what, that was the expectation that our Constitution was built upon. And it works really well if the people live up to that expectation. It works really badly if we think that the government officials themselves are going to live up to that expectation by the voluntary goodness of their hearts. So, Mike, we have a situation where we have people in power and in government and all three branches of government, mostly uh, the judiciary and the executive, where the Constitution doesn't really mean much. Uh, there isn't much that they're interested in following. Uh, it, it, it's not there to constrain them by any stretch. Uh, they don't care what the Declaration of Independence meant or said or what we think it means. And, uh, and the media obviously repeats that, that message and supports the violations that, that they, they engage in. So how do we um, address this problem and come forward towards a constitutional nation? Where, how do you compete or with, with ideas or, or how do you defend your liberty in this environment? Well, I mean, it, it, there's, there's a hundred different answers to that. But let's just take one that's really low-hanging fruit. If, if we can transfer issues back to the state government, does that mean our state government is going to be angels? Well, the quotations you just read me from your state legislators shows that ain't true. But the, the good news is it's much easier to remove a member of the New Hampshire House than it is to remove a member of the United States Senate. 
It's just the, the politics of it are so much different. And so, you know, you simply make them eat those quotes. Uh, you know, every person in their district, you walk their district, you punish them for, the, for their constitutional and hatred. They hate the Constitution, what it amounts to. I mean, we can, you know, put fancy words around it if we want to, but that's what it amounts to. And, and in New Hampshire, I think it would matter. I think people will lose votes. And if we are able to consistently constitute, uh, hold people to their constitutional duties, um, it, it, it will matter. I mean, I, I've been focused in the last couple of days on this Iran Treaty, among other things. And my, I kind of have career ADHD, and I, I do a lot of different stuff. I, I, about five years ago, got an, a, an LLM in public international law from the University of London. So because, mainly because I wanted to fight UN treaties being adopt, adopting the United States, and I wanted to have the credentials to do that with. So in the process, I got a degree in what amounts to treaty law. Um, and so this Iran deal that we're dealing with, 98 senators, including every Republican running for president, Cruz, you know, Rubio, uh, Rubio all of them, Graham and uh, third one, uh, Rand Paul, all of them voted to change the process from the process outlined in the Constitution. Yeah. The process outlined in the Constitution is you go negotiate a treaty, Mr. President, you bring it back to us, then we read the treaty, we see what's in it, and we decide if we like it, and then if two-thirds of us agree on behalf of our constituents, the two-thirds of us agree that we want to enter this into this entanglement with this other country, then we approve it. And instead, by a simple majority vote process, um, they agreed to turn the tables and have to repeal by a two-thirds majority vote the treaty that Obama has negotiated. All the Republican candidates for president voted for that. They voted to disobey the Constitution. And now they have buyer's remorse. They see what's in the treaty. They go, oh, no, no, we don't want to ratify that. They gave away the game when they decided not to follow the Constitution. And we've got to call people out on that. We've got to say, okay, if you think you're going to be a constitutionalist, Ted Cruz, and you did that, no, you're not a constitutionalist. You may be something conservative, some kind of, but you're not a constitutionalist. Rand Paul, you think you're a constitutionalist? You did that? You're not a constitutionalist. You voted to change the Constitution so that you gave Obama the power to not only do all kinds of other bad stuff, he wants to take $11.9 billion from the American taxpayers and give it to Iran. And we don't have a vote on that? Well, thank you, guys. That, you that's, that's, that's incredible. So a, a plain law cannot change the Constitution, so why don't they just s declare by a simple majority vote, you know what, after review, this is a treaty, and it will not pass until it has a two-thirds majority. And, uh, dear Mr. Ayatollah, this will be thrown out by the next president, which is well, what Tom Cotton said. It, 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 if they had a spine, you might see that. Um, I've been working for the last couple days on trying to figure out a way to sue them over this. Uh, you know, sue to have the treaty declared unconstitutional, but the Supreme Court has adopted rules that make it really, really hard for anybody to have legal standing to do that. Now, I think I've found some, some you know, I, I've got, I think I've got a path, um, but I, you know, I'm not ready to announce it publicly yet. But, but I am working to bring a constitutional challenge to this treaty. But, you know, really, one way to do it is, is if, if 34 U.S. senators would rise up and say, look, we were wrong, and we will stand together, and we will follow the lawsuit, they would have standing. Mm -hmm. But to get 34 Republican senators, or Democrats, really, by, uh, you know, just start with Republicans, 34 Republican senators that said that our vote was unconstitutional, and we're willing to file a lawsuit challenging all this, uh, good luck with that. Unfortunately. Well, they need to admit they're wrong. Uh, senator Marco Rubio is also a U.S. senator who's also running for president. He's been up to New Hampshire a number of times. Saw him speak at Americans for Prosperity a few weeks ago. Um, now, how many how many members of Congress are running for president right now? Four or five. Well, yeah. Um, and can we hold their feet to the fire as presidential candidates since we are in New Hampshire and we have the first in the nation primary? Well, I, I need to hold your feet to the fire by, th by simply saying we're going to support somebody else. I mean, that behavior needs to be punished so badly. People will say, you know, not only these guys need to be punished, anybody in the future who wants to run for president, and they do something like that again, they go, 
ah, remember the lesson of 2016. If you support uh, 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 and run around the Constitution on how we adopt treaties, you're going to get your head handed to you when you run, run for president. That lesson needs to be marked down and remembered for 40 or 50 years. All right, Mark, uh, Mike, we're all out of time. Um, how can people get in touch with you or reach you online? Um, I, I do a lot on my Facebook page. It's just Michael Ferris. So if they look for a public figure page, Facebook page. But hslda.org is the website for homeschooling issues. Patrick Henry College is at phc.edu. And I do a lot of work with the Convention of States process called conventionofstates.org. All right, Mike, thanks so much for being on the show. Have a great weekend. You too, guys. All right, thanks. Goodbye. All right, that's it. Coming up next is, uh, where'd my list go? Lawrence McQuillian. And uh, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. New Hampshire is famous for scenic drives, but they're tough to enjoy when you're on your way to the doctor. Because Obamacare limits your choices, some will have to drive more than an hour to see a doctor. What's health insurance worth if care isn't there when you need it? Jean Shaheen voted for Obamacare, putting your doctors and hospitals further out of reach. Tell Senator Shaheen, Obamacare is not working for New Hampshire. Jean Shaheen and her allies are making false claims about her record on veterans. The truth? Shaheen refused to meet with veterans pushing for reform. She wasn't on the committee that wrote the reform legislation and refused to co-sponsor important VA reforms in the VA Management Accountability Act until after the VA scandal broke. When our veterans needed her, Jean Shaheen was AWOL. Tell Jean Shaheen to stop distorting the truth and fix the VA. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. We are your fire-breathing, hard-charging, gun-toting, outspoken, razzle-rousing, razzle, razzle, <laughs> freedom-loving conservatives and libertarians. Um, thanks to Mike Ferris for joining us on the show. Uh, a lot of great pull quotes in that interview. Uh, I can't wait to get into it and, and listen to it again. Um, again, Dan Hines came in to talk to us about religious liberty uh, earlier in the program. And, of course, Max Abramson joined us. It's always great to have Max here. He has tons to contribute. And uh, we're going to move forward now. Um, Our next guest is uh, Lawrence McQuillan. He is a senior fellow and director of the Center of Entrepreneurial Innovation at the Independent Institute. Um, Received his Ph.D. in economics from George Mason University. Served as chief economist at the Illinois Policy Institute. Director of business and economic studies at the Pacific Research Institute. He's written a book called California Dreaming, Lessons in How to Resolve America's Public Pension Crisis. Uh, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, good morning. Great to be with you. Great to have you on. So, um, this is a great topic. We've uh, we've had a couple of different folks on to talk about this. Um, I can't remember who was on last. We were talking about pensions like three or four weeks ago, and it's a huge problem. I think in Illinois we were talking about. Well, wasn't, it, right. wasn't it one of the AFP folks? We it had was also? somebody from AFP, yes, yeah. and I can't remember who it was. But you've written this great book. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I obviously it needed to be written. Why did you decide to do it? <laughs> 
Well, it's um, you know kind of a, a, a national financial crisis that's facing you know almost every state has an unfunded public pension debt, and uh, you know being an economist, I, I like anything financial, and uh, it's a rising issue across the country, and particularly in California where I live and where the institute is. Um, right now, we have a seven hundred and fifty billion dollar. That's with a B. $750 billion unfunded public pension debt just for California alone. Um, nationwide, it's $4.7 trillion. So, I mean, it's a huge crisis. And I think, um, you know, not a lot of people are aware of the, the extent of it and, and what kind of impact it's having on local governments, local communities. So, uh, I think it's an ideal topic for a book. And, and this book is kind of a primer. If you don't know a whole lot about it, um, you can pick it up and read it rather quickly, and it'll kind of give you everything you need to know to get caught up on the issue. So, uh, let's. Um, how did this start? I mean, I know, but maybe our listeners aren't familiar. Uh, we've this has been going on obviously for decades, and we're, we've reached a tipping point. Clearly, you haven't in in California. We certainly have a similar problem in New Hampshire, where we have is it a two or four billion dollar? I got to find what headset you're on. Sorry, Max. Go ahead. It's somewhere between four and fourteen billion, depending on who you talk to. Right. So, uh, um, mm -hmm. how did this begin? <laughs> well, actually, the, the story is quite similar across states. I mean, what happened is for decades, politicians increased pension benefits primarily to buy votes and campaign contributions. You know, people they, they knew people would vote for them if they increased the pension benefits, and at the same time, though, they lowballed the contributions year after year. They weren't putting enough money into the pension fund so that ultimately there would be enough money in the pot 20, 30, 40 years down the road when people started retiring. Um, and it was an easy process to do for politicians because they knew the bill would come due, you know, 20, 30, 40 years out. They'd probably be long gone out of office, which is generally the case. It's certainly the case in California. Um, and, and yet they could promise the moon today knowing that they'd be long gone when the costs were due. So it's a, you know, political, it's a perfect recipe for just political manipulation, and that's exactly what happened. Um, legislators just faced perverse incentives to mismanage these funds, and that's the way it was um, across the country. And, of course, if they lowballed the contribution, it freed up money they could use for other programs, and they could buy votes and campaign contributions with that money using it for other ways. And... So they played this game for decades, and now we're, you know the, the um, bill has come due, and taxpayers are now on the hook to make up the difference because the money's just not there. Now, uh, this is Skip Murphy. Thanks for coming on the show. Certainly, I've been watching this in Illinois and especially in California. I've just been waiting with dread about uh, a federal bailout. Yeah, federal bailout from a right. federal government that owes over eighteen trillion dollars now with unfunded, you know, in the hundreds of trillions. But you look at the, the cities and the towns in California especially and Chicago right now whose unfunded pension liabilities have basically said we can pay the pensions, which that's what the court seemed to be telling them to do. And now there are no services in a lot of these um, towns and cities. We see the same thing happening in Rhode Island. And how long do you think this is going to come to fruition as to the point of – we just can't pay, and we're going to take people's homes because they don't pay enough in taxes to be able to sell them off, to be able to pay these liabilities. I mean, this whole thing is a mess, but for the individual citizen living in cities where this mayhem that you just described happens, what's going to be the end point? Well, the end point you know, has already been reached in some parts of especially in California, where we've seen three cities already go bankrupt, over largely over unaffordable pension costs. Um, Vallejo was first, and then Stockton, California, and then more recently San Bernardino. So I, I think people out here in California especially are very aware of what can happen, what has happened. And, um, and keep in mind, like you said, well before bankruptcy, well before insolvency, what happens is that politicians divert money out of other accounts into the pension fund to try to make it work. And so that's what they've been doing out here in California, um, taking money out of police and fire, schools, 
libraries, roads, you know, poor government services that, especially in a blue state like California, I mean, people like and they expect to be there, you know, right? When you pick up the phone and dial 911, I mean, you want the police to show up. and But they've been taking money out of that. I mean, we've seen a huge depletion of the police force in Oakland and San Jose, um, largely because that money has been going to pay uh, for very generous pension benefits. Um, in Oakland, for example, they cut the police force by 80 police because they needed the money for the pensions, and um, a few days later they announced they would no longer respond to 44 different crimes. So, <laughs> so I think, you know, when you reach that point where you're sacrificing public safety for pension costs, I mean, I think that's the tipping point, and out here I think people get it. A recent survey of likely voters showed that 85% of likely voters in California see pension costs as either a problem or a big problem. So I think voters out here are way ahead of the legislators because they've, they've lived this and they've seen the schools crumble and, and the, the police not show up and um, fire services cut, fire stations closed in Stockton, for example. So I think the public gets it. It's just a matter of getting a significant reform measure before the public, and I think they would vote for it. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, I mean, the people voted with their feet in Detroit because it became untenable as a place to live, and they first of all d derided white flight, leaving the blacks to suffer. Uh, in fact, anybody who could afford to get out did, including any black families who had managed to make it up the ladder before the rungs were cut off, uh, You know, leave, leaving the city in complete disarray and decay, and Chicago's going the same way. Uh, but what I was going to say about your, your comment on the pensions and the, the cutting of the Oakland police, any betting that those living on the uh, the pensions that are being paid are not living within the city limits where they would be subject to that reduced uh, protection? In other words, they're living somewhere out yeah. in the suburbs, up the slopes of Mount Diablo or something, uh, and uh, nowhere near the danger that their pensions are exposing the others to. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And, and I mean, a lot of the pensioners are outside the state of California. In fact, there was recently a map that shows where all the CalPERS, which is the California Public Employees Retirement System, the biggest uh, public pension program in, in the United States, and that yeah, it showed a map. And so many of the, the retirees have left California, um, and the money just leaves the state. And of course, too. Um, so, and, and you mentioned Detroit. I mean, that's that's a classic example of what can go wrong. Um, not only don't, don't you have enough money for paying pensions, but you end up not having enough money to even keep the street lights on. And exactly. that's exactly what happened. And then ultimately, what they did in bankruptcy is they cut, they reduced pension benefits for current retirees. So they actually ended up cutting checks for, um, for pensions for current retirees and in Detroit, and I think, you know, that's exactly why I think either current public employees that are retired or soon to be retired should support the reforms that I talk about in my book, because um, it would guarantee that at least they would get paid for what they've earned, and, and we wouldn't have to go this route that they did in Detroit, which is actually reducing pension checks for, for retired right. people who are counting on that money being there. Um. Lawrence, this is Skip again. Now, a couple moments ago, you mentioned one of my infamous, not my infamous, but one of those phrases I really hate to have to bring up, but the blue social model, which you've aptly described, you know, in a sort of a roundabout way. And I think it would be good for our listeners if you actually described what that model is, although we have lots of examples because that's what we're talking about. But do you think those, along with the description, do you think those cities and states are going to recognize the error of their ways and go back to, you know, do the opposite of what they've been doing, or are they going to continue to act like Greece? Um, well, I mean, in some cases, they won't have any alternative because, you know, at the local government level, you know, you face some pretty tight constraints. So you can't get away with the shenanigans that they can at the state and certainly the federal government level. But, um, but yeah, I mean, what, what we've seen, been seen is a, a very small group of people 
public employees in states. Um, I mean, in California, only 11% of the population uh, is uh, el- eligible for a public employee pension. So it's a very small percentage of the population is causing this huge impact on, on budgets at the same local level in California. And, and they're devouring uh, an ever greater percentage of the budget. Um, for example, I mean, the bottom line is that pension costs are increasing four times the rate of tax revenue in California at the local government level. So just do the math, and anything that's increasing four times the base is eventually going to devour the base. And that, that's what we're seeing. You know, larger and larger percentage of the budgets are going to pensions, leaving less and less for other services. And, you know, in a blue state, you know, people... People like their government services, um, you know, especially the core essential ones. And that's, unfortunately, you know, where most of the cuts have been happening in police and fire because that's where the, the, the bigger salaries are and where the biggest, um, you know, pension benefits tend to be as well. So, so yeah, I mean, we've seen this situation grow over time where, um, you know, excessive uh, benefit increases for pensions of have ultimately led now to fewer and fewer government services. And this certainly gets the attention of, um, you know, Democrats and people who typically would be favorable towards uh, government are seeing now this, this particular sector of government as being uh, a huge burden and a huge drag on, on what they kind of see as, um, you know, the quality of life that they'd like to have for their states or local communities going forward. And the primary funding for my book came from, from San Francisco Democrats. So, I mean, people get it now. I mean, people are seeing firsthand the, the long-term effects. And I think Detroit and, you know, the three bankruptcies in California certainly got people's attention. And they're seeing that for the ultimate nightmare, it could, it could end up. And, um, and it could go this way even still. I mean, Richard Reardon, the former mayor of Los Angeles, said that. L.A. could go bankrupt in the next couple of years because of unaffordable pension costs. So we're not out of the woods, but but there are proposals now being floated for the ballot in 2016 that would have at least move in the right direction of fixing this problem. Lawrence, we're going to take a really, really short break. Stay on the line. We will be right back. Hi, Rich Gerard, host of Dread at Large in the Morning. The Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Grok Talk. Thank you for tuning into the live stream to Ustream to YouTube to iHeart to TuneIn to Spreaker to Stitcher. All those great places. Check out our page at patreon.com, P A T R E O N.com slash Grok Talk. Make a donation and a regular donation to support the program. Software upgrades, equipment. We don't pay ourselves. It's all about keeping the show on the air. And part of keeping that show on the air is having guests like the gentleman we are currently speaking to, Lawrence McQuillan, talking about pensions and the downward spiral into bankruptcy. And Max, uh, who is a state rep, had a question for you, sir. Hang on, let me turn his microphone on. The the, uh, drunk driving cop who I defeated in November for my position as state representative, after he smashed into a parked Kia and hit it, destroyed it, hit it so hard that he rammed it into a parked pickup truck, sent both drivers to the hospital with injuries. He threw his badge on the seat and walked away from the, uh, the, uh, the crime scene. And instead of uh, getting any jail time, he was forced into early retirement, but he gets to draw a $6,000 a month Hello? 
pension for life, plus the Cadillac medical plan, plus full dental, job training, college, everything. People, have heard, people hear about this kind of thing, and they're saying, well, who's paying for it? And it, ultimately, it's the taxpayer who pays for it. I, th- I think, what was the figure a couple of years ago? Hang on a minute. Lawrence, can you hear us? I think we've somehow lost a connection. Hold on a second. Hello? Are you there? Yeah. Can you hear us? He can't hear us. What happened? Uh-oh. So, uh-oh. We have a technical problem. Um, Skip's going to work on it. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear the guest, but we can't hear, he can't hear us, and I don't know why... How about that? Can you hear us now? Hello. I can. Oh, there you go. Sorry. You. Yeah, yeah, we we're, we're, good. we're good. I'm sorry. So, what is the nationwide total? I read a few years ago that it was 5 or 6 trillion dollars in unfunded pension liabilities nationwide for state and local public employees. Do you know what the figure is now? Yeah, well, you'd be right. It's a, it's the latest figure is 4.7 trillion dollars. That's with a T. 4.7 trillion nationally and as you mentioned, I mean, some states are worse than others. Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, Texas, and California, for example, have really bad unfunded um, public pension debt. But um, but most states have uh, unfunded debt to some extent. And on average, overall, the states are only about 40% funded. So what is so, that, about $14,000 for every man, woman, and child in the country? Right, right, yeah, they... And, and keep in mind that that's money that should be in the bank today, you know, earning compounded interest over time to make sure that there's enough money in the pot when people retire. And so that money should be in there today, and it isn't. And now, um, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, politicians have been robbing other accounts and putting that money in the pensions trying to make this work, but it's, it's not working. So what's the path to uh, resolve this problem? What what are our options? Um, I'm sure you explore them in your book in, in detail because obviously there's no point in writing about it unless you have an idea about how we can fix it. Well, the most important change that needs to be made is for state and local governments to transition over to 401k uh, pensions because um, they're much more transparent, they're more affordable, um, they're always fully funded. There's never an unfunded liability that taxpayers have to make up. And um, it's also very easy to show that in most cases, it, it, the employee comes out better than they do under the old-fashioned defined benefit plan. And that's because um, those plans made more sense when people stayed with the same employer for 30, 40 years because they're backloaded in terms of the benefits. Uh, but, but let's face it, I mean, most people today don't want to work for the same place. 40 years, like my dad did. Um, you know, they, they like flexibility. They're just a much more mobile workforce. And the beauty of a 401k is that, you know, you own the account. It's your money. It's portable. If you change jobs, the money goes with you. Um, so it's a much more modern way of providing retirement security than the old-fashioned defined benefit plans. But I show in my book, though, that for California, and this would work in other states, though, that if you would transition everybody into a 401k, um, you'd actually create the savings that you could use to pay down the accumulated debt. So if everybody was transitioned, all the public employees at the state level in California were transitioned to a 401k, um, the state would save more than $6 billion a year that they could then use to pay down the debt and pay for the benefits that have already been earned And people are counting on that money being there. So we don't have to go the road of Detroit and actually cut checks and reduce checks for people who have already earned their benefits or on in in retirement. Yeah, you know, the the unions fight tooth and nail, as they did in Detroit, claiming it was a constitutional matter that their pensions be preserved at all costs. Uh, And, you know, I say to you, to them, it's a pyrrhic victory. What you are guaranteeing for yourselves is 100% of nothing when the thing eventually goes bankrupt. That's right. Instead of getting maybe 90% of something if you convert it into a 401k. That's true, yeah. And and after the ruling in Detroit by the federal bankruptcy judge um, and the ruling in stock in California, uh, for the first time ever um, in California, a federal bankruptcy judge ruled that that a city in bankruptcy can reduce current pension checks. Um, so now we've got two court decisions saying the same thing. I think um, you know retirees should be re- very nervous that the money is going to be there when they need it. And that's why if they were to support what I'm recommending in the book, 
a transition to a 401k for new people, then it would, um, or for current, you know, workers, then it would guarantee that the money is going to be there for current retirees or people just about to retire. So I think it makes a lot of sense for current, you know, government retirees to back this proposal that I'm recommending because that way the, you'd actually, the cities and counties would save the money they need going forward to pay for the promises already made and the benefits already earned. I mean, these people did the work. That was the agreement when they did the work. Um, they've earned the benefits. They're now retired. So I, I think they should get that money. I, I think that's the moral position. But so how do we pay for it? And the best way to do it is to transition to a 401k because then we'll, we'll generate the savings that we need to actually pay for these benefits that have been earned. Lawrence, is there any, um, uh, we have, I have a, one friend in particular who I always think about who worked for the police, he worked for the FBI, he worked really hard, he worked in a dangerous job, and by the time he was like 45 or 50 years old, he retired on a full pension. He then went and got a security job making more than I make, and he's going to collect that pension for the next however long he lives. Is there any move in California or any other state to uh, try to get the unions to realign these contracts so that maybe they can retire and go get another job, but that they can't collect until they're older? Because, I mean, collecting that kind of a pension for 20 or 30 years is killing people, Uh, everybody else, not the... the Yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, there were reforms uh, three years ago, 2012, that were passed in California that that reduced or, or kind of eliminated some of the tricks that were used to um, to hike uh, pension benefits. So, for example, pension spiking, it's called, where you would work in um, unpaid overtime, unpaid vacation that you had in, on account, and then you'd put, you'd use, you'd work that into your final compensation because final compensation um, is used to determine your pension benefits. So, so there was a lot of shenanigans like that where. People would, would save up all their unused vacation and then cash it in at the bitter end, and then that would really spike up their pensions, sometimes to the point where they, they would actually make a higher pension in retirement than their final salary that they made while they were working. So there was a lot of that, and that's been, um, you know, reined in somewhat. But the problem is is that things like that, I mean, you, you can you can – save a little bit of money like that that would save between 75 and 80 billion dollars a year the things that they passed in 2012 but you know we're facing a 750 billion dollar unfunded pension debt so you know it helps it gets you about 10 percent of the savings but it doesn't get you where you need to be and and that's the problem with pensions is that it's it's really uh it's like trying to you know, change the direction of a blimp. You know, you turn the wheel, and about six miles down the road, it starts to, <laughs> to move. And that's kind of with pensions, because the whatever changes you made have to work through the system for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years until people start retiring. So you really don't see the benefit until way out in terms of the savings. Um, so in order to get really significant structural savings, I mean, you got to make a, an important, significant change to the pension plans. And and that's the shift to a 401k. That's the only thing that really generates the savings that you you need in order to bring these costs um, in in control, these costs going forward, and also have the money that we need to pay down the debt without cutting, you know, services even more. At least that would kind of hold the line on services too, which you know in the blue state is very popular. So. Um, so I think that makes the most sense. And, and the other, and again, this, part of this will be on a ballot initiative, hopefully, in, in 2016 in California. Um, and the other aspect of this ballot initiative in 2016 that's being proposed is to have voters have the final say for any benefit increases going forward. So politicians can't do what they did in the past. So if, if they want to um, increase pension benefits going forward, do they need to get the approval of voters? And other regions of the country that have this check on politicians, um, they've avoided some of the major problems with their pension funds that we've seen in other parts of the country. So I think it, it would, that would be a really significant reform is to allow voters to have the final say. I mean, it seems only fair, right? I mean, they're going to have to pick up the bill eventually, so they, they should be able to have the final say in what the financial obligations will be. 
Yeah, isn't this a, actually a, a problem from the micro to the macro level, meaning it happens in the small towns, your, our local towns, and it happens, of course, at the national level with Social Security? If we don't convert this from a defined benefit into a defined contribution plan, where the money is explicitly vested for the uh, owner, we're going to have this problem writ very, very large indeed. We actually don't have time for you to answer that. Um, we're running out of time, and I want people to know where they can go to get your book. Oh, sure. Thank you. Yeah, California Dreaming is the title, and it's available on Amazon and also our website, which is independent.org. Well, thank you so much for taking some of your Saturday morning to talk to us. We really hey, thank you so it. much. I appreciate it. All right. You have a great weekend. You too. Bye-bye. All right. That's this week's show. Uh, we want to thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to check us out on iTunes, iHeart, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And please visit patreon.com slash grogtalk to support the program. We will see you next week with more news, more conversation, more grog talk. New Hampshire is famous for scenic drives, but they're tough to enjoy when you're on your way to the doctor. Because Obamacare limits your choices, some will have to drive more than an hour to see a doctor. What's health insurance worth if care isn't there when you need it? Jean Shaheen voted for Obamacare, putting your doctors and hospitals further out of reach. Tell Senator Shaheen, Obamacare is not working for New Hampshire. Jean Shaheen and her allies are making false claims about her record on veterans. The truth? Shaheen refused to meet with veterans pushing for reform. She wasn't on the committee that wrote the reform legislation and refused to co-sponsor important VA reforms in the VA Management Accountability Act until after the VA scandal broke. When our veterans needed her, Jean Shaheen was AWOL. Tell Jean Shaheen to stop distorting the truth and fix the VA. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. The Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Oh,